in, in theater history. So he's somebody who's been a performer. He's somebody who's an academic and he's somebody who's a writer. And he's somebody that I'd like to introduce you to, David Carlion, who is going to talk to us today about the history of clowning in America, David. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm excited about this. Um, the, 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 this opening shot of the elders is a little misleading because we're not gonna talk much about individual clowns. Uh, it's more as my, oh, come on now. There we go. Uh, it's about historical trends. Um, first, circus clowns, workers whose main goal is to engage a crowd. Um, and that, that deliberately contrasts with all of the various, kind of contrasts with everything we know about clowns. That is the symbols, the myths, the cliches, the lies, the fabrications. Um, they're all out there. And by, by putting lies at the end, that's kind of for dramatic purposes, but the symbols, all of the things uh, that we talk about, those have a history. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today, the work versus ideas about the figure. And you know, um, David, I wanted to tell people that they may have comments during the uh, presentation today. So if you do, at the bottom of your screen, there's a note that says chat, feel free to just write what your questions or comments are. And uh, Bruce Hawley, who's also on the call, will be happy to uh, pass those on to uh, David. Thanks, yeah, great reminder. Um, and one of the biggest cliches is behind the scenes, look behind the image, what's the clown really like? Those are legitimate questions and always uh, kind of curiosity, but over time, they are their own cliche. So let me see, historical trends, the work in images, uh, uh, mostly the United States and mostly men. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. And my background, uh, to be a little more specific to this talk, I know the 19th century from research and writing for 30 years about it, which was informed by what came before that, my experience as a clown, and before that and after that as an actor, and the 21st century kind of combines it all. So um, I, I figured out a, a quick way of uh, encapsulating the talk, clowns with an exclamation mark, that was 19th century clowns being contrary. Clowns in quotation marks, what we think we know about clowns, we being all of us um, over time. And uh, clowns with a question mark, 21st century confusion. So here we go. I think we go. There we go. Um, first, a little background on the circus. The first 30 years of American circus were ambiguous years. It wasn't clear what this thing was. Uh, if you look for any circus history, they're going to talk about the first American circus in John Bill Ricketts in 1793, Philadelphia. Um, some will talk about earlier shows and all of those skills that combined into circus, but for various reasons that you can read about in my book or in the book that I'm writing, um, it was 1793. But question mark, it wasn't called, yay, uh, it wasn't called circus yet. It's not clear if it would survive. Um, and most early comedy was not in the clowns, but in comic writing. And for those of you who are CH members or want to become CH members, the next bandwagon issue will have my article on comic writing. Uh, uh, the comic act variously called Billy Button, The Taylor Rides to Brentford, and Johnny Gilpin. Then in the 1820s, drastic change, a new structure that exploded interest in Jacksonian America. First, the writer switched from saddle to bareback. That was an enormous change because it made the act harder, it made the act more dangerous and more thrilling and hence more appealing. Um, and in the process, the writer became the symbol of the American common man, though the American uncommon common man. That, that's the American paradox. We're all equal and yet we're all, each of us is special. Uh, the writer encapsulated that. Uh, but the writer without saddle or bridle couldn't control the horse. So you needed a master of the ring, otherwise known as the ring master. He became the symbol of the authority figure and dressed that way, that, that whole red coat and uh, top hat, um, that standard look 
is the English gentleman writing to the hounds, very elite. Um, and then the clown who had been kind of uh, uh, not very important um, became, uh, rediscovered the ancient contrary impulse of the clown back through history uh, by uh, defying the ringmaster. Um, and through the 19th century and into the 20th century, circus clown was the base of what people considered clowns. There are other kinds of clowns. There are stage clowns that preceded circus clowns, obviously. Uh, the word clown may have meant a country rustic. Uh, you can see that in As You Like It, Shakespeare's play, where you've got a, a, an official clown and a country clown. But circus clown was what people thought of when they thought of clowns. Um, so that structure changed circus and it turned it into a national institution and American folk life. That is, it was something that everybody consciously thought about as this thing coming to town, this thing in the cities, but it was also embedded deep in American life. Because- and Definitely people, something that, that brought the country together, right? I mean, it was something that really uh, was probably one of the first most cohesive things that brought the entire country, the United States together. Absolutely. I, I would argue, actually I do at the bottom here, it was a rare, truly national institution. Nothing else had the reach, consistent reach, as the circus. Um, and it has uh, a, a couple reasons for, for this. Oh, getting back to the point about being embedded in American life. Um, the people who are doing those things, the clowns, the writers, the acrobats, People watching are thinking, hey, I can do that. I mean, Ringling Brothers, the Ringling Boys started a circus with exactly that impulse. It was very democratic impulse. It was spectacular and yet reachable. Um, geographically, it spread more than any other institution. It was in city theaters and summer tents. Wherever the American population went, the circus went. Again, more than any other institution. I'm sure there's some institution I'm thinking of, uh, not thinking of, but uh, the post office. Post office wasn't a network, national network the way it is now. Um, the army was spread across the country, but in localized forts, circus went everywhere. Uh, and those tents seated thousands at a time. I like to think of the round tent, the ring and the people around it, like an electric armature winding up energy. Um, the circus also had democratic range. It attracted more people and more diversity, men and women, black and white, sometimes segregated, sometimes not, uh, elite and workers. Um, now, this is important. Children, everything I say is important, but this is especially important. Children attended, but as an afterthought, for the first nearly a century, this was adult amusement. Uh, and it also got critical acclaim. It wasn't simply popular. It was something that Charles Dickens, Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, uh, Herman Melville, uh, others wrote about as this admirable thing that should be emulated. Um, as an example, uh, later, uh, later nostalgia depicted these small times, small town, small tents, but they were enormous. This is Dan Rice's in 1852, um, even though circus exaggerates and the tent wasn't probably this big, it did seat thousands. It wasn't some little thing uh, seating a few hundred, it was thousands. At the same time, circus was a city amusement. Uh, they played urban theaters, they played, uh, Dan, uh, Dan Rice played the Walnut Street Theater, where I also played as an actor. Um, uh, here in New Orleans, uh, he, he built Dan Rice's amphitheater, seated 2000. Um, and the, the bill you see on the right, let's see, is it the right or the left? I'm not sure. It's on um, our right. Okay, Dan Rice's great show. So it had the circus and this enormous spectacle a spectacle, including a, quote, full court ballet. 
that's the ballet girls. We'll talk about those later. Uh, ballet girls being women who shut off their legs. Um, but he, he did, uh, what, 20, 30 years before Wagner, he presented the magic ring. So circus was big time. It wasn't this small thing that suddenly exploded with the corporate giants late century. It was big time in the 40s, 1840s and 1850s. You can tell I work in the uh, 19th century. I tend to think of the 40s as the 1840s, of course. Who doesn't? <laughs> um, now, the clown. Where does the clown fit in that? The contrary clown of the 19th century. The clown had one challenge, the ancient challenge of any comedian. Use comedy to engage audiences. The cliches were starting to uh, filter in. Um, Charles Dickens in Hard Times talks uh, presents the circus as a kind of escape from the pressures of industrial, more than pressures, the depredations of industrialization. But the contrary clown said and did what everyone knew shouldn't be said or done. Uh, and that could, that was a wide range. It could uh, be knockabout clowns and innocuous joke tellers um, to the rebel clown, to the, the one who was directly challenging authority. Um, so the clown popularity, defying authority, uh, as I said, rediscovering that ancient contrary nature, explicitly uh, defying the master of the ring and implicitly defying authority generally. If you've ever heard anybody or have yourself ever said, oh, they shouldn't do that. It, people will get the wrong idea. People, it will uh, lure children to uh, do or say bad things. That was the clown. Um, and then defiance as a model of American democratic behavior. Again, the uncommon common man, you can't tell me what to do is the implicit American motto. The clown modeled that in the circus. Especially Dan Rice, uh, uh, called the great American humorist. He was a talking clown. He was one of the major celebrities uh, one of the most well-known people of the century and was probably seen at least before the Civil War by more Americans than any other figure uh, because of those enormous tents, because he played in the summer in tent seating thousands and went everywhere. He was in uh, city theaters in the winters in major cities, um, New York, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, New Orleans, Cincinnati. And I'm just uh, going to do a little commercial for you here, David. Uh, okay. David knows a lot about Dan Rice. He uh, wrote a book a few years ago called The Most Famous Man You've Never Heard Of. Uh, New York Times uh, gave you a great review on that. And of course, the Circus Historical Society gave you the Stuart Thayer Award. So uh, when, when David talks about Dan Rice, he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> the rest of it, who knows? But at least Dan Rice. Um, the, uh, by the way, at the end of this, there I will have two screenshots that will hold for a while that will uh, give a list of sources. One of them will be uh, things I wrote about. You know, uh, before you go on, uh, Margaret Kirby just asked a question, David. Was Dan Rice literate? Was he educated? What a great question. Um, it's a great question because it feeds into the theme of this. By the time the Gilded Age came around, it was presumed that circus was innocuous stuff for children. And as part of that, Dan Rice not only got portrayed as illiterate, but he sort of fed into that and said, I really didn't know what I was talking about. He was, uh, though he didn't have much schooling, um, he was an extremely literate and uh, very smart to brilliant man. Um, his, he, he, there's a letter he wrote to Stephen Foster's brother, Mitt Foster, Morrison Foster. They were friends of his from his early days in Pittsburgh. Uh, and it's got all of the flowery language that you'd expect of the Gilded Age, the kind of thing that Mark Twain uh, mocked, but very definitely literate um, and portrayed as illiterate. Um, so his immediate appeal were the subjects of sex, violence, and politics. His immense talent uh, was, um, he, he had a light and quick wit. Uh, Mark Twain 
probably writing about Dan Rice when he came to Hannibal when uh, Twain was young San Clemens, wrote about the clown, most killed the people, people uh, and got back at the ringmaster quick as a wink with the funniest things the body ever said. Again, the shift from what contemporaries knew and what uh, a retrospective view did with circus. I've also written about uh, the influence of circus on Huckleberry Finn. And most historians who have looked at Huckleberry Finn and look at this circus episode have said that he wasn't, the clown wasn't really funny. That's an example of Huck being a child and uh, not understanding that he was really bad. That's based on nothing in the book. <laughs> it's based on the retrospective view of circus as children's stuff. Um, and if you want me to dig into that, I'll, I've got uh, the article listed at the end. Okay. But there was a third thing that really uh, uh, got, uh, that really uh, propelled Rice's fame, and that is his cultural instincts. As the middle class was emerging, he was claiming middle class aspiration. He aspired to something higher. He claimed that he was not presenting amusement but art. He said he was no clown but the great American humorist. He said his was no circus but Dan Rice's great show. And, you know, I mean, back to Margaret's question and the literate uh, yeah. answer. I mean, he did parodies of Shakespeare, right? So you have to like know Shakespeare to be able to do a parody of Shakespeare. <laughs> well, yes and no. Uh, I, it turns out I discovered in a British magazine from the 19th century that this was, it was a parody that had been written about 10 years oh, before. Interesting. So he was repeating it. Nonetheless, he, he could have read Shakespeare. Well, actually, speaking of Shakespeare, one of those later stories is talking about him parading down the street in a wagon with a, in a carriage with Shakespeare on his lap, when for the life of him on his lap, when for the life of him, he could never have understood a word in it, which is just I mean, you don't get more wrong than that. You gotta be careful of history. <laughs> so sex, violence, and politics. Um, I'll, I'll hit violence first. This is just a note from his uh, journal, 1856. And he's describing a brawl he had in a courtroom that he caught a pickpocket. They took him to the local judge. The local judge was biased because the pickpocket was friends of locals. And the thing erupted in a fight. It reads like a movie treat. Circuses had to be fighting units because on the road, coming to a strange town or coming to a town as strangers every day, there was a fight. In that, uh, it, was, it was universal. Um, uh, particularly, I'm proud of this in uh, mining towns, river towns, young men, and college towns, including my pride, my alma mater at the University of Michigan was notorious for circus fights. So, but, so if you were a circus, uh, you did not want to go to Ann Arbor. Is that what you're telling me? Yep, yep. <laughs> um, and well, no, you went because you knew there was going to be a fight. It was just the price to pay to make the money. Uh, you didn't skip anywhere. Um, but it was sometimes fatal. I mean, often it was just brawls, but sometimes it was fatal. People got killed. There was uh, called the, uh, Fred Fenning would know, the, um, the great circus war it may have been called in Ohio. And I think in the same year, 1856, where in the 1850s at least, where a circus was stuck in town fighting for a couple days. Mm -hmm. they, they couldn't disengage to get their wagons out of town and people got killed. Um, sex. Another reason that it was not kid stuff, circus was peddling sex. Uh, clowns joked about sex. In, in 20th century parlance, they worked blue. They were telling dirty jokes. Um, Dan Rice got arrested for adultery, escaped, made his way back, was in jail for a while, and then for a while that became a talking point in his performance. He was a talking clown, remember? So he was talking about his adultery. Meanwhile, this is uh, this image on the left, uh, hoopla, it's called. Um, it's a woman showing off, well, it's, no. Let me rephrase that to make it correct. It's a man drawing pictures of and writing about women displaying themselves. Um, 
the, let me see, can we do this? The, um, uh, where is it? There, and that uh, poster behind me is uh, a standard image of 19th century circus. It may be the most common image of 19th century circus in children's books, trade cards, posters. It's a woman in arabesque, uh, that a ballet term for one leg on the back of the horse and one leg uh, raised behind in a short skirt and with a man in almost all of them, a man looking up her skirt. It was a not so subtle signal to potential customers come here to see uh, barely clothed women and barely clothed men. Walt Whitman um, talked about how it, uh, forget the phrasing, but how it, it would be good for boys to see a full figure of a man uh, in his tights. And um, so it was, it was peddling sex. Uh, and that's what people went to it for. And then politics, uh, clowns often um, in, their, in their comedy uh, used hits on the times, political references. Dan Rice increased that till he was running for office from the circus ring, a le a legitimately. He ran for the Pennsylvania State Senate. He uh, was briefly a candidate for Congress from Erie, Pennsylvania, and he, uh, he ran for president. Now, he didn't last into the presidential campaign, but the year before, during the Civil War, he was touted as one of the half dozen possibilities in the same way now we're used to um, the uh, 12 to 20 people who might be running for president in uh, 2024. So David, that costume looks kind of familiar that he's wearing there. Ah, Uncle Sam. Though there's no exact source of Uncle Sam, with all due respect to the various etymologies, uh, Troy New York claims Uncle Sam Wilson because he was Sam and people called him uncle. Um, Dan Rice was probably the most famous man of the country. He was a peace Democrat. So Thomas Nast, who drew the Uncle Sam figure that we're used to, uh, wouldn't have used a Democrat like Rice consciously. On the other hand, a visual person like a cartoonist like Nast would have known that this image, stars and stripes, stars and stripes, by the way, are very much clown material, uh, top hat, and let's back up here a little bit. And Dan Rice also appeared in the ring like this as the American humorist. That is, he dressed up like a gentleman. If you think about the, the Uncle Sam character, it's kind of a strange, it's kind of a strange symbol for America because he's he looks like a diplomat. And we're a country that considers ourselves not elite. But that image, the Uncle Sam image, combines this, uh, costume of Dan Rice and the costume he wore, evening clothes, looking like a gentleman, plus the top hat, plus that very unusual, well, not very, but that unusual goatee. Uh, no mustache, just a goatee. So he wasn't the direct uh, inspiration, but I believe the strongest uh, influence on Thomas Nast for the Uncle Sam figure. Now, um, oh, and his deeper appeal, he was the American contrary clown. He made himself a celebra uh, national celebrity by defying authority, not only the ringmaster, but speaking against things in politics. Uh, he was a key force in making circus a national institution. And, and doing it with, with humor too, right? I mean, it's- with, Oh yeah, with humor. He's kind uh, of the, the Jay Leno or Johnny Carson or- you know, John, John Stewart. Stewart of the day, right? Right. Yeah. Combine um, Lenny Bruce, John Stewart, and Robin Williams. And you get a sense of his energy and his comedy. Uh, and this quotation um, talks about the wide range that Dan Rice and Circus generally had at the time. This is 1858 at a show in Newport. Um, 
All classes, ages, colors, and conditions were in the tent, all mixed up with democratic indiscrimination. Um, a couple of years before that, Walt Whitman uh, reviewed Rice's Circus in Brooklyn with similar praise. And for those of you who are uh, patient, my next book will be Circus and Democracy and Twine. Um, I hope you don't have to be too patient. <laughs> so, switching gears, we got this contrary clown delighting men and women, talking about sex, fighting in fights. Oh, by the way, Dan Rice was a major brawler himself. He was either suing somebody or fighting somebody almost all the time. Um, so how did this contrary clown for adults become the kitty favorite? It's the Gilded Age that did it. So now I'm, I'm putting this as uh, 20th century clown cliches, but they really started in the Gilded Age, especially the 1880s, 1890s. Um, in the Gilded Age, something, we had another major shift. Circus itself didn't significantly change. It had been big time, it stayed big time. You now got three rings, you got bigger tents, the big top, you got railroad travel, um, but it didn't make, but it was essentially the same kind of performance. What you did have now though was this new frame of circus as unsophisticated fare for children. And it continues to dominate our ideas about circus today. Uh, looking ahead a little bit, in the late 20th and, uh, century and the 21st century, in our era, uh, there are lots of new efforts to say that implicitly or explicitly say, we're not normal children's stuff. We're more sophisticated, we're more artistic, we're politically challenging, we're socially active. But always as a kind of distancing from the presumed foundation of circus as kiddie stuff. It's a distinction started in the Gilded Age. So the cliches, sneaking under the tent, running away and joining the circus, a uh, circus for children of all ages. That all came in the uh, 1880s, 70s, 1880s, 1890s. Clown cliches joined them. The symbol of happiness. Dan Rice was not the bluebird of happiness, but now the clown got framed that way. The sweet clown is the innocent children's friend, the sad clown. Originally, by the way, lost love, but later sad about a sick or dying child. But now in the late 19th century and through the and into much of the 20th century, there were two challenges. Do the work well, that ancient task of anybody trying to do comedy with an audience, just <laughs> try to get better at it. And now balance the work and deal with the cliches. How are we doing on time? I guess we're still in the ballpark. Um, now, from the 1880s to 1960s, these are all rough figures and you'll have to read my book for me to get more specific, but for our purposes today, the cliches didn't matter as much because they didn't affect what a clown did. A clown didn't have to do kitty things. Um, so the old timers into the 1960s, um, Apprenticeship system persisted. There was no training program. You just tried to stick around and they wouldn't talk to you. The old timers wouldn't talk to you if you were first of May, beginning clown or beginning performer on the circus. They wouldn't talk to you for a year or two, literally. They wouldn't talk to you. You were scum um, until you proved you were with it and for it. Um, it was also a career. You didn't do what most what mm, I'll say most of Clown College graduates did, dip in for a while and then left, like me. Uh, and you were a genuine outsider. That's also a key point because starting with the 1960s, uh, well, especially uh, from then, we all like to think of ourselves as outsiders. For goodness sakes, there was a movie out there once upon a time about growing up in Beverly, Beverly Hills, but the poor part of Beverly. Um, we're all outsiders. You know, I, I, I had to, well, anyway, um, I mean, I do it too. So, but that, but they were genuinely outsiders then. Um, if uh, Prince Paul, uh, midget clown, he preferred midget, 
uh, the, the phrase midget. Um, I mean, no, 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 he dwarfed time, I'm sorry. He didn't like little people. He didn't like that phrase. But if he didn't have the circus, I mean, he would have found some work, but he didn't have something to fall back on. He didn't have a college degree. He didn't have that law degree or accounting degree or business degree to go do something else. Um, so the cliches were more in the publicity than in the clown's work. Um, clowns were described as kids' favorite. Again, it became dominant in the Gilded Age and continues. But the work itself didn't change significantly. And now, respect for the elders. Um, Geez, I was about to get teary about this. Um, the uh, Slivers Oakley down here, uh, lower middle, uh, most famous circus clown of uh, the early 1900s, um, nationally famous. People knew who Slivers Oakley was, uh, maybe the most famous since um, Dan Rice. Though Billy Burke, this is totally aside, has nothing to do with his talk, uh, but I just love it. Billy Burke the Clown had a daughter named Billy Burke who became the, uh, uh, the good witch in um, uh, Wizard of Oz. Um, so there's Slivers Oakley. Then um, there's Lou Jacobs, master clown and master teacher. Even if you don't know Circus, you've seen his face without realizing it. It was on Ringling posters for decades. Uh, and that picture, I chose that picture particularly because that was a snapshot of him just demonstrating before he taught us in clown college. And he was a wonderful teacher. He wasn't real big on positive reinforcement, which is, I believe, crucially important for teachers. But for all of us wannabes who thought really too much of ourselves because we got into clown college, for goodness sakes. And some of us got a contract with the circus, so we're hot stuff. And he said, <laughs> I brought in this brilliant idea. And he said, no, no, I'm not going to try the German accent. And I had shown it to everybody and everybody loved it. He said, no, spaghetti. That was his brilliant word for too much action, like spaghetti falling off a plate. Lou was great, great performer, great clown, and a great teacher. Otto Griebling there uh, to the right. Um, some consider him the best clown, uh, American clown of the 20th century. Um, and then in the corners, the masters I worked with, Mark Anthony and, yeah, I'm doing it again. Um, Prince Paul. Uh, it, it took me a while as a clown to recognize how good they were. Um, they weren't flashy, they weren't famous. Uh, and for a long time, I've thought of them as one thing they were, which is workaday clowns. They came in and they did their job. That's harder to do than, than it may seem. Uh, two a day, three on Saturday, six days a week, 11 months a year. It's a grind. So to come in and do it every day and never take an act off, never take a show off, never take the day off. Um, but gradually as I learned more, you know, the old thing about uh, uh, learn, your father gets smarter the older you get, gradually I learned how well they were doing it too. It wasn't just that they showed up, they showed up and did it well. Okay, um, now the 60s. 1960s, I'm putting 2000 because I didn't want to leave that, hang that 60s hanging, but roughly the late 19th century, that countercultural impulse, the hippie impulse, do it yourself, uh, uh, another shift. Women clowns became an important cohort. There had been a few women clowns before, but very few and more the kind of thing that you draw up so that you can say, oh yes, there was, what was her name, Lady Yvette. Um, so there were some. And uh, at the end, I've got a source, uh, John Towson, has got a blog that's got a series on women clowns, women in clowning. Um, that's that's really excellent. But now they became uh, uh, an important part of what clowning was and what clown, clowns did. Now the clown college, uh, three benefits. One for the show itself, it got lots of publicity. Writers love to write about the college for clowns. It was also for Ringling's benefit. Uh, 
an eight to 10 week, 11 week, sometimes audition. They could observe you, your work ethic, your personality. <laughs> were, you gonna, were you gonna show up, for instance? Um, and if you were good, fine. I mean, they were looking for people who would be good clowns, but you know, a brilliant clown who is there four out of five days a week, yeah, ain't gonna happen. And it was also a 30 year experiment. Can classes teach clowning? And I say now with uh, the old timers said no. And with apologies to all of those who teach clown classes, I agree. Classes can't teach clowning, but, 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 to all of my friends who teach clowning, and, uh, which I've done too, it provides students with an important, a solid foundation. I just want to say, David, um, you know, we and you and I have talked about Clown College a lot over, and I noticed that one of the people who we have on the call today is one of our great CHS members and former Ringling and Circus performer, Sarah Chapman. And of course, uh -huh. her husband, Danny Chapman, uh, was one of those who was very, very actively at the very start of Clown College. In fact, uh, I understand that it, the I idea was actually hatched at their kitchen table one night, and she was there. But anyway, go on. I digress. Hi, hi, thank you for the digression. Hi, Sarah. I, we, I don't think we've met, but uh, thank you and to Danny. Um, and I hope, I hope, I'm trying to make it clear that, well, respect, much respect for those who have taught and do teach. And Clown College was a, a, a key element, a key uh, formation of my life. Um, now, Late 20th century clowns had two challenges. I said that before, do the work well and deal with cliches. And dealing with the cliches meant that they were in your mind. You couldn't help it because everybody in the world knew about it. And it also meant that when you're performing, you know everybody watching knows the cliches. 1880s, uh, the child's friend, the sad clown, 1960s, all of that uh, 60s stuff, be true to yourself, be artistic, be a trickster, challenge audiences. And then the 1990s, the scary clown. Notice it's in scare quotes. We'll talk about that later. But those are ideas. Again, I start with the premise that the core of a circus clown is a worker who tries to use, who uses comedy to try to engage an audience. Um, now there was a kind of a, a challenge part B of two for ch clown college graduates. First, the training is itself a cliche. I mean, that's why it's so appealing to writers. They go, oh, a college for clowns. That's when clowns learn to be a clown. Yeah, nah, you learn to be a clown, clowning, working with an audience, I believe. Um, so, but the challenge for clown college graduates, and I saw it all around me, <laughs> and uh, I recognized it myself. You had to figure out that it was the start of learning, not the end. That getting a contract with Ringling didn't make you a circus clown. It, it, it got you the label, but actually it's true in most fields. I mean, law school, I know a little bit about that. Um, you get to the job and then they say, okay, now we're going to teach you how to practice law. Um, however, for all of that, great compensating uh, advantages for Clown College graduates. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows to make mistakes and learn. Um, well, David, I, I just want to stop you for a second here before we get too sure. much further down the line. Uh, you know, we have a great group who's watching uh, this episode of Circus History Live live, and I'm sure we'll have more later watching it recorded. And one of the people who's on the call is uh, Denise Payne, who was one of the first African-American female clowns with the Ringling Circus. And so, uh, hi, Denise. And so talk, if you could kind of go back a little bit too, because there were blackface clowns also on the circus, especially back in the 19th century. And, you know, what role did they play uh, in the circus? I mean, we don't oh, yeah. see that today, but yeah. in those times. Um, it, it, as race often is uh, in the United States, it's a fraught subject. Um, briefly, because I, I do want to get onto the 21st century, but sure, sure. three things. One, uh, <clears throat> the first evidence we, uh, 19th century clowns and into the 20th century and on stage and movie actors, part of your uh, skill set was blackface. 
white people doing their ideas uh, evolved through black, uh, white, uh, white minds uh, of what blacks sounded like. Um, and <clears throat> as a matter of fact, well, I think it's a matter of fact, the minstrel scholars, minstrel C scholars disagree. Uh, the first minstrel troupe was a circus quartet, the Virginia minstrels. Mm -hmm. So minstrelsy grew out of circus because 19th century clowns were white face and black face clowns. They did both. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, Stuart Thayer found, and I'm still having trouble finding it again, but uh, shows had to advertise it in the 1830s if they didn't have a black face clown. So common was it. Um, and the, our, first, our first evidence of Dan Rice in his own words was a letter he wrote to Mitt Foster, an earlier letter, uh, I am going it with a perfect rush and my, uh, um, basically my white face and my black face clowning is getting me uh, paid double, uh, 25 a week, which was big money at the time. So you've got that. Clowns did do blackface uh, like the rest of the culture. Um, circus was a rare uh, institution that uh, sometimes had integrated audiences, as that quotation attests. Um, cheek to cheek, so to speak, squeezed together among the thousands, white folks and black folks together. Really rare. Um, so um, that's anyway, the I'm 19th. sorry to digress, but I thought it was kind of an interesting uh, question that Margaret had brought up. So. Thanks, thanks. And uh, so I said compensating advantage is the other one, the subtitle of my book, Mentors, Audiences, and Mistakes. Um, the book, by the way, is in the, in the shape of a memoir. It seems to be a memoir about my first year with Ringling, but it's really about learning to do comedy with a live audience after Clown College. Um, it's got observations of Lou Jacobs' masterful teaching, Mark Anthony and Prince Paul, and how they worked and how I discovered their work. And then personal thoughts for you circus folks out there on Charlie Bauman, Camel John, uh, Biscuits and Jim, for those of you who knew the uh, vendors, um, Donita Bale. Uh, I flirted with her all the time, um, <laughs> which she tolerated uh, as she always was regally. Um, the Polish workers, Bulgarian performers. So that's... Uh, yeah, this is a uh, book, by the way, which uh, David has just recently released, and I know that it's uh, available. There's some on the Circus Historical Society website on Facebook. Uh, there's some information on how you can get that, too. Anyway, sorry to keep you going there. Okay. Uh, now, historical context. Sad Clown, Trickster, and Scary Clown. 19th century started the Sad Clown. Again, we've got the image versus the work. Um, people would Pagliacci, see the Pagliacci, right? The, the opera. Pagliacci, Absolutely. 1890s. Pagliacci, uh, which, which I, looking it up, discovered is cognate with payaso, the Spanish word for clown. Um, mm -hmm. When I was performing in, the first time I was performing in a significantly Spanish-speaking area, I forget where it was, I, kids would go, mira, mira, the clown. And so I started going around saying, yo soy mira. And for those of you who are Spanish speakers, you already get the joke. Mira means look. So I was saying, I am look. I was a payaso. Anyway, the Pagliacci, uh, silent movies, a lot of those silent movies that, well, maybe most of the silent movies uh, that were circus based were a clown in love with the equestrian, with the trapeze artist, um, he who gets slapped. Poodle um, Staniford, a great example of a clown equestrian, right? Who uh, came out of the audience and jumped up on the horse. Uh, right. Everybody thought he was a drunk at first and he was the best uh, equestrian on the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I put this picture because to the left in the picture is Otto Griebling, who was a tramp clown, which usually translates to people thinking of him as a sad clown. He looked uh, down on his luck, but he was very, very funny. He wasn't acting sad. He was in that persona as like an actor and making people laugh, genuinely laugh. We sometimes forget because everybody thinks one of the things I learned as a clown is that adults didn't really expect me to be funny. They were surprised when I was. Um, so let me see, oh, the trickster. 
here we got the 1960s, um, the trickster and the jester. Um, there are historical foundations for the trickster, ancient cultures, the uh, Kashari of Native American cultures, um, and it resembles the contrary clown, but mostly the use since the 1960s is somebody making fun of somebody else, people in power for an audience. They're not really fighting those, uh, that power of the jester speaking truth to power. Yeah, it's a lovely uh, image fable, but there's almost no evidence, documented evidence of a jester defying uh, the, the king. There yeah, if you are were really, if you were really a court jester, you had to pretty much toe the line with the king, I would think, and maybe make absolutely. fun of his enemies. As, as, as an example of how powerful the fiction is, though, how, how powerful the fable is, almost every instance that talks about the jester defying the ruler uses the fool and King Lear as an example. But that's fiction. It's made up. Um, there, there's something to it. It's not, but again, at the sources at the end, I, I wrote about the trickster. Um, now, 21st century, and I want to wrap this up pretty quickly. So uh, things changed again. Um, you had this divide, it, this Ross Chast cartoon, May 31st, 1993. Great. Two centuries and two months after the first American circus, and she captured the shifts that was happening and it, that it started in the 60s. Now, those big tacky show, uh, the, the caption, I'm going to run away and join the circus, not one of those big tacky <laughs> ones, something more European and intimate. You were, you were getting a split in how people saw circus. There was that entertainment, the tacky ones, Ringling, and having been on Ringling, I, I could feel that judgment coming uh, among my chronological peers. Um, even though, uh, uh, one thing I skipped before, uh, the great thing, of, one of the great things about a Ringling Clown is that despite its reputation for big spectacle and for being controlled by Charlie Bauman, who was fierce, it was such a big operation with so much going on that you could do individual things with individual people. You could follow a clown impulse. So ironically, it gave you more freedom than the, uh, than the image suggests. And also there was come in where a few of us went up into the seats and I did it so much that I started doing my own come in 20 minutes before. So I did a 40 minute pre-show, um, just going up into the seats and dealing with whatever people said. So there Ringling was Brothers, Farnham and Carlion. <laughs> if if uh, Charlie Bauman were still alive, he'd, he'd track me down and um, vociferously object. Um, so revival. Uh, popular new energy, the Feld's reviving Ringling, very important. Uh, high status new energy, Big Apple Circus, Pickle Family Circus, Cirque du Soleil, Circus Kirk, and later Universe Soul, Circus Harmony, Circus Mercus. Lots of really good stuff. Um, clowning, uh, Ringling's Clown College. It was really, um, though the, the do-it-yourself folks who created their own shows tended to see, oh, and, and well, not just them, uh, old-time Ringling folks tended to see uh, Ringling Clown College graduates as cookie cutter clowns who are just dancing chorus boys. Um, it was part of the same impulse to revive circus. Um, clowns rediscovered the discipline of street clowning. Um, European influences became important. Training, <laughs> now training, well, not now, with Ringling's Clown College and, and other things. Training became a part of the way people did it now. Um, you saw the same thing with, with acting you know, through the middle of the 20th century. To be an actor, you went to New York or LA and tried to get a job. Increasingly, you need an MFA and everybody assumes that just part of the process. It was happening in um, clowning too. And major trends in the actual 21st century, Cirque du Soleil, the big one, circus arts, gyms, training, exercise, empowerment, and that divide uh, high status versus popular. Well, and, and you know, and new technology, you know, uh, Denise Payne pointed out, you know, the computerized lighting effects that were oh, happening, oh, yeah. you know, at, at the last performance of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, people texting and it was being, you know, seen on the, on the, uh, on the jumbotrons. 
Absolutely, uh, Denise, that's, that's such a huge point. I mean, that could have been this whole talk, just the 21st century changes. But um, I do wanna wrap up here uh, quickly, but 21st century clowns now have three challenges. One, do the work well, the ancient impulse. Two, deal with challenges, because you're always dealing with people's, you know, are you a happy clown or a sad clown? Uh, oh, oh no, uh, uh, my kid's afraid of clowns. Uh, are you a trickster? Or do you challenge us? Or all of those. But the new challenge, find work. You need work to survive and you need work to develop. Um, you got Cirque du Soleil, a big institution like Ringley used to be, but few clowns and also controlled performance, more like a play. You can't follow an impulse. Well, I take that back. Uh, I've talked to a few Cirque du Soleil clowns, but maybe there's an opportunity. But when I watched it, I never saw a chance to go, in effect, off script. Work, be an entrepreneur, cobbling gigs together. But that's being an entrepreneur is a totally different skill. And there are some who do it really well, but it's a skill that you also need to do. In circus art training, one of the jobs you get is training others. Um, so it's hard, it's really hard. And it's not clear what a circus is or what, or what a clown is. Um, okay, sad clown, scary clown. Um, you know, uh, Sarah Chapman brought up, and I think this is a good point here too, you know, uh, and I'll kind of preface it by saying the circus and clowning as a result lives in a lot of places, right? I mean, you could have uh, gone to see Dan Rice's circus in 1850, and uh, probably you could take that person who was in the audience and put them at a performance of Cirque du Soleil and it wouldn't really seem out of the ordinary just because you'd see a clown and you'd see you know acts on trapeze of course the technology has changed but don't you think that uh, as Sarah points out really when it comes to clowning uh, in any century the clown kind of appeals to your emotions as much as anything else absolutely from my perspective again I, I did just tons of come in so I was up in the seats, uh, sort of like street clowning, dealing with whatever people said or did. Snarky teenagers, uh, 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 shy kid, um, a couple on a date, a uh, family, whatever people said or did was what I had to deal with. So for my money, for my experience, it's dealing with that. And, but it's, yeah, it's dealing with emotions and using comedy to do that. Um, I remember once I, I, there was a woman sitting, a uh, middle-aged woman sitting by herself in uh, Birmingham, uh, Binghamton, um, come in. Uh, I walked up, I sat down next to her, you know, full makeup and costume. And she said, my husband just died. And I thought, mm, not time for a joke. So I said, I'm sorry. And we just sat there for a minute or two. Um, so, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm addressing it well, but yes, reach the emotions, but it's, it's tougher to do it individually with Cirque du Soleil. But I you know, I, with Cirque du Soleil, I think that it is, but uh, I, you know, I look at the list of the terrific group that we have on here today, and I noticed that Stacia Kelly is on the line. Her father, Emmett Kelly, was mm -hmm. the king of the come on, right? I mean, he was the guy who could go up and nibble on a piece of cabbage and look at a woman and get the entire section of seats to be laughing yeah. at it, even though it had a certain amount of pathos to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Emmett Kelly, uh, Otto, um, my mentors and, and uh, clown college graduates before me, um, uh, Kevin Bick, uh, Bickford and uh, Billy Baker, they were great doing uh, uh, carpet clowning in, in person, one-to-one. -one. Um, so, I, I don't want to go too long, so, but I do want to get... You know, we have a few more minutes left, and uh, we have taken a lot of great, um, you know, comments uh, that people have written. If you don't mind, Denise, I'd like to open up the microphone, open up your microphone, and I'd like to, for you to kind of tell us about your experience as a clown college graduate. Oh, David, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? Uh, I, I think that's a great idea, but I just want to let people know, if you want a screenshot, here are sites I look at, consult. Um, Pat Cashin's, uh, uh, well, you can read it if you're interested. And then, so, and now I'm going to switch to the other one. Oh, and sorry. these are my articles and books. 
and you can take a screenshot of that if you're interested. Um, so go ahead. And of Bruce. course, this uh, I mean, this Chris presentation will be available on um, on our Circus Historical Society website, circushistory.org. Uh, if you're not a member of the CHS, I urge you to consider joining. Uh, we obviously do these presentations monthly for free. If you wanna make a donation, that's a good place to do it. But I would also encourage you to consider joining uh, and our quarterly publication bandwagon, which I think is truly uh, you know, a, a world-class publication on history and especially circus history. But uh, Denise, I see you there on the call. And uh, thanks for joining us today. You know, we talked a little bit about the fact that you were uh, not only one of the first female clowns, the Clown College graduates, uh, to get a contract with Ringling, but also one of the first women of color to be uh, on the Clown Alley on Ringling. Tell us a little bit about your experience, not only at Clown College, but also on the road. Oh, hi, thanks. Hello, everybody. This is really- Hi, Denise. Hi, David, how are you? Cool. I'm fine. I'm glad you're here. This is, this is important. Yeah, it's very important. We got to keep this going. Yeah, yeah no, I, graduated... I, I mean you. I mean you joining oh. us. <laughs> yeah, I graduated uh, Clown College in 1978. Um, I okay. went to Clown College without the intention of being a clown. I never thought about being a clown. I wanted to be an actress. I studied at Lee Strasberg Theater Institute uh -huh. in New York, but fell into clowning. Because believe it or not, at one of the shows that I was doing, it was a, um, a variety show, I played the dummy to a ventriloquist. The same thing like what Barry Lubin and uh, Jim Tinsman were doing. This is before I even heard of them. And a lady came out um, afterwards and uh, said that I had good facial expressions and uh, had I ever thought about being a clown. And um, after she- What an opening me, line. I, <laughs> I um, uh, heard about the Clown College auditions that she told me about and went and auditioned and then uh, got on uh, to 1978 class. And it was like a school like no other school that I had been to. Papa was there, Papa Lou was there. Um, uh, but we had so many different instructors. Barry Lubin, for example, Jim Tinsman. We had uh, people from France, Michelle Nowak and her husband came and taught us mine. We had a lot. There was, um, um, well, you know, all about uh, Clown College. And I was the only uh, person of color in my class, but it was not different for me because I grew up Air Force and wherever I went, oh. I was basically the only person of color in my school. So I didn't feel like uh, a raisin in the sun, basically. When I got on uh, to Clown, uh, on the Red Unit, Irvin Phil put me on uh, the Red Unit to start the first season in 1979. I was uh, first of May. And uh, that's where I say that I was born. And you're absolutely right. You don't learn uh, clowning in clown college. You learn the technique is what I think. And yeah. uh, I started to learn clowning down through time. But uh, one thing when I joined up, um, there were um, not that many black clowns. There were Skeeter Reese, Gary White. Yeah. Yeah, were the ones on Reggie, uh, the Reggie Montgomery was, I think, the first. Uh, exactly, Reggie Montgomery was the first, right? Uh, the first black lady clown that came along was um, uh, Bernice Collins. A year before me, she yeah, went on the, the blue unit. Yes, yeah, she yeah. went on the blue unit. I came along as the first on the red unit. But as we started touring, um, the prob one of the problems that I came across is that. As well, it was twofold actually. First of all, because clowns are thought of as being men and white men, a lot of people didn't know what the heck to think, you know, I was. <laughs> I got um, a, a lot of times that people would tap me on the shoulder, you know, and they talk to me and they say, excuse me, sir, but uh, can you tell me blah, 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 you know? And I'm like, um, and I start talking and they go, oh, excuse me, you're a girl. You know, people thought that I cross-dressed a lot of times, you know, in spite of everything. So I started changing my costume to make it distinctly, you know, un uh, identifiable as being a woman clown. 99% of the time, it, uh, it worked. People still, you know, thought that I was a, a man clown. But uh, being a Black clown, being a Black woman clown uh, touring was a, a different, it was, it was, uh, it was different but yet it was the same. We still performed come in in the early days. We did come in, we did performing. You know, I um, went up to uh, the kids and, you know, talked to them. As the, 
that was in 1979-78, for example. But like I said, uh, it changed later on because uh, I did a lot of shows between when I left Ringling and then 22 years later, Kenneth Feld asked me back to come back. And the difference uh, between the shows and what, how it was operated and how it ran and what the clowns did, well, it was very, very stark, <laughs> you know, and that's oh, why, I was saying, yeah, that's why I was saying that uh, there was very little room there was some, but very little room for improvisation because there was computerized lighting. There was a strip on the um, on the um, okay on the floor, and it had numbers, and you had to stay oh. on your numbers. Like my first very oh first, no yeah, it was incredible, and I didn't know about this. Um, the performance director on day one of rehearsals when um, they started. First of all, the kids quote unquote, other clowns, you know, they had cell phones, you know, they were talking on their cell phones, you know, during rehearsals. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is interesting. And then when rehearsals started, um, uh, Phil McKinley uh, said to me, he was the director, said to me, Denise, you start out on number 26 or whatever my number was. And then he said to the next person, then the next person, their numbers. And I'm thinking, what the heck is he talking about? number 26 i had no idea i wasn't informed you know but i learned real quick i looked down and i saw that number strip it was like a a long wide yardstick up and down the length of the track you know zero was that ring two and it went one two three four that way and then one two three four the other it was really interesting so i learned a lot both times that i was on uh, on ringling and you were kind I, of there for two of two of david's uh eras that he talked about you know yeah. that's right yeah that's yeah. exactly right yeah very it was very interesting very interesting and there's no other no show you know like like the greatest show you know even though it's gone now it's still here yeah. you know? well but, and uh, we still have a chance to bring people together for uh things like circus history live where we can share that passion uh through the miracle of the internet really and make true. new friends around the world and uh denise i really appreciate you joining us uh and giving thanks. us your observations today that was great uh, david, denise thanks I, david i'm gonna kind of throw it back to you for some closing thoughts and uh maybe if you want to run through those sources again just so that people know where they can uh, learn more about clowning in the over the last okay episode. mine uh the education of the circus clown that's the one i showed about uh my year with ringling or my first year with ringling dan rice about the 19th century clown uh scary clowns i i discussed it on uh on the smithsonian website uh smithsonian institution circus festival you can find it there or carlion and smithsonian might bring it up circus and sex uh in uh, an academic journal but libraries could get it soft and silky around her hips. Um, I, I, uh, then circus influence on Twain, all of the various ways that circus shaped Huckleberry Finn that Twain scholars never quite noticed. And then the, I'm being polite here, the romance of the trickster. I, I'd like to call it, well, the trickster's academic comfort food. Um, so that's mine. And then here are, oh, wait, wait, no, no. Uh, slide show get down there that's all part of the act folks that's the part we yeah reverse. yeah um start and yeah 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 yeah. okay okay okay, okay, okay. the and the other one john Towson, pat cashin's blog that steve copeland is now uh yep. keeping up to date um and there we go there we go um walter kerr silent counts clowns i found he wrote about the time i was joining ringling and his observations in silent film clowns seemed to me particularly apt for uh, circus clowns uh, travis d uh has travel lunch this blog on popular amusements with lots of crossover and john Towson, and some others john davison bruce uh, johnson have uh presences on the internet clown theory on facebook and the circles historical society on facebook and uh Mention again, John Towson, his clowns still, uh, since 1976, probably the best single source on clowns. So um, 
questions? Are we done? Is it time for a drink? What, what's next? <laughs> well, I, uh, you know, I just want to uh, thank everybody for their participation today. Uh, once again, Circus History Live is an opportunity for us to get together uh, once a month and talk to people about the things that, that we love, the passion that we have for the circus. Uh, we've been fortunate to have people from all over the world join us. I know on today's call, uh, we had a couple of questions from Margaret Kirby, who actually is with us uh, from Australia. So, uh, you know, we appreciate the time zone difference, whether you're in Australia or France, where we've had other uh, people join us in the past. Say hi to my cousin. She's in Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, thanks again. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on another episode of Circus History Live next month. I hope that you uh, have an opportunity to go to circushistory.org, which is our uh, website. Uh, if you're not a member of the Circus Historical Society, again, I encourage you uh, to join. It is probably the, uh, in my opinion, for someone who's taking the time to join us on this call, it's probably the best uh, expenditure of $60 that you can do uh, today. So uh, again, uh, we'll see you down the road. Do I get a cut? And, and <laughs> maybe you do. Uh, <laughs> and once again, uh, thanks for joining us for another example, another episode of Circus History Live. Thank you all. Right to Denise. Thank you. Great job.